Hi everybody, it's Susan. Today we're going to talk about alterations in mobility and how it affects multi-system disorders. Just a reminder for a productive learning environment, you might want to turn off your cell phones, um, not using any Facebook pictures or text so that you can just focus on what is important at the moment. So enjoy the presentation. So I'm going to be using mainly our Iggy book, chapters 49 and 51. Much of your information comes out of that. You might also look at your ATI book, um, the RN Med Surge um, book, and that'll also give you snippets of each different topic. A couple of these things are not expressed um, well in Iggy. They're very short. Um, so if you want to look them up on the internet, that would be great to help put all the pieces together. Again, some of the things that we talk about today are definitely things that will affect multi-system disorders. So not only our musculoskeletal system, but you're going to see lung and liver involvement and also circulation or tissue perfusion. So I want you to be thinking about that. But this slide just talks about alteration in mobility related to musculoskeletal system failure. And as you'll notice, it says as evidenced by bone deformity joint pain, skeletal muscle injury, and supporting structure issues. Another nursing diagnosis would include alterations in sensory perception related to nerve damage from the trauma or whatever the disease might be. Causes of decreased mobility can be from diseases, which many of these are discussed in chapter 50, and I don't believe I included that in your readings. Um, we're gonna focus more on the trauma aspect and surgical aspect of um, causes for decreased mobility. Problems associated with prolonged immobility, um, many of these things you can think off the top of your head, but we do have problems with skin breakdown, whether it's from the injury itself or whether it's from the immobility um, and um, decreased activity. We can also have problems with constipation, and again, that can be from the immobility also associated with um, the medications sometimes that we use to help correct the pain and also um, thrombus formation becomes a um, threat life-threatening event that occur can can occur from the immobility chapter 49 discusses the anatomy of the skeletal system um, with the bones and they they discuss four different types of bones the long bones, the short bones, the flat bones, and the irregular bones. So long bones are the bones that are cylindrical with round edges and they or ends and they can um, bear weight such as our femur bone. Our short bones are much smaller and they bear little to no weight so examples of that would be phalanges. Flat bones are bones that actually protect our vital organs such as our heart and our lungs. Um, and even um, our, um, our kidneys kind of in a way. So our scapula, our sternum, our rib bones, those would be included there. And then our irregular bones are uniquely shaped bones and that would be like our wrist bone for sure. Um, so the picture here just gives you a brief overview of what the bone is made up of. The one thing with the structure and the composition that I want you to be thinking about is a they're very vasculature and so with a break in a bone we have a high chance for hemorrhage also um, if we have a break in the bone um, and or a puncture to the bone itself we may have problems with infection and so those are some things that we have to be um, attuned to as we think about the anatomy of the bones here's a picture of mr bones um, you'll see each individual bone, just a little review for you in case you can't remember what all the bones are called. Um, when we are in the nursing um, field, um, especially if we're on a um, trauma unit or an orthopedic unit, um, ICU, you may even see uh, pa patients that come in with uh, multiple fractures. You need to know what the bones are and what the functions of those bones are. Um, at birth, we have 270 total bones, but as our bones start fusing together, such as our, our cranium, um, in adulthood, we have 206 total bones uh, post-fusion. 
A joint is where two bones of the skeletal system are joined together, or they call that articulation. Sinarthrodial are immovable joints such as the cranium. There is no, mo no movement to those joints at all, um, and they become fused at, after, shortly after birth. Um, am amphartrodial are slightly movable joints, so things such as the pelvis or the vertebrae um, fall in that category. Diothrodial, or they know are called synovial, are freely moving. So those would be our ball and socket and our hinge joints, such as our knees, elbows, and our hips. We have three different types of muscles, smooth muscle, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and skeletal muscle. The skeletal muscles are striated voluntary muscles. They are controlled by the central and peripheral nervous system they're held in place by connective tissues and the entire muscle is surrounded by fascia, which is um, a, a covering that does not have a lot of give. The tendons hold muscle to bone and ligaments will attach bone to bone. Our musculoskeletal system has several functions. It does provide the framework for our body. It supports all the surrounding tissues. <clears throat> it assists our body in movement it will protect vital organs. So again, our ribs, um, our sternum, encapsulate our lungs and our heart, which are um, vital organs that we can't do without. Also, our cranium will protect our brain. So those are two or three important um, bones that we need to be able to protect those vital organs. Um, the other thing, musculoskeletal system function um, is manufacturing of blood cells. So that becomes an important part of the overall health of our body and also the storage of calcium and phosphorus in particular. It's good for us to get a good musculoskeletal system history. So asking things about accidents, um, how they occurred, where they occurred, when they occurred, um, any particular illnesses that could affect our musculoskeletal um, system. So if our patients maybe have been bedridden for a while, we know that they're going to um, be weak and their muscles are going to atrophy. Um, specific lifestyles um, and drug and alcohol and tobacco intake. We know that we have constriction of blood vessels if we are um, smoking. And so that can affect the overall health of our um, muscles itself looking at different illnesses and diseases that affect, affect the musculoskeletal system, whether it happens to be something like a muscular um, skeletal or multiple sclerosis is what I want to say, multiple sclerosis or any other um, illness or disease that can affect our overall status. Is our patient able to perform their activities of daily living? Do they have um, restrictions because of an illness? Do they have restrictions because of contractures that have occurred to joints? Um, or maybe they just don't have the energy to perform those ADLs because of um, deconditioning. We have to identify patients um, whether or not they have any weight-bearing activities that are um, involved in their day-to-day -day activities. Again, remember the weight-bearing activities will help strengthen the bone, so that plays an important role. Um, different occupations that might be hazardous to our musculoskeletal system, and we'll learn about that a little bit more when um, we talk maybe about traumatic amputations. And then allergies to dairy products or other things. We know dairy products and the calcium we intake with the dairy products are very important for our bones and also medications. Are they taking medications such as steroids? Because steroids can affect the overall strength of the bone. So our patients maybe that have COPD and are on steroids often for their lungs may end up having um, brittle bones. Other things that we need to look at are nutritional histories. What is our patient eating? Do they have a well-balanced diet? Um, are they getting plenty of protein for their muscles and calcium for their bones. How much are they eating? Are they overweight or underweight? 
anybody that um, is overweight, their body is having to, um, or their body puts more pressure and stress on, on the bones and the muscles themselves. Um, so um, having a good healthy weight is what would be ideal for our patients. Um, what supplements is important for um, calcium absorption and where does it come from? Again, we need to know that vitamin C is gonna help for our calcium absorption um, and vitamin D um, are also important. So we need to make sure that um, our patients are getting plenty of um, vitamin C and vitamin D in their diet and or from the sunlight. Our patients lactose intolerance, maybe they can't even um, intake the calcium that they need from the foods because they're not tolerating those. And then another thing we need to look at the family history and genetic history. So, you know, do they have uh, problems such as osteoporosis, um, which makes your bones, bones brittle, gout, osteogenic uh, genetic sarcoma. And then lastly, we need to look at current health problems. Um, do they have any pain that's preventing them from doing an activity or weakness um, that is not allowing them to be able to tolerate that activity? And then the other thing with illness or with injuries themselves, we have to remember that proximal weakness will um, indicate a muscle issue, muscle concern, or a myopathy that's going on. But if we have a distal, distal weakness, then we have more of a problem that indicates a neuropathy. Minerals and hormones that affect the bone and bone growth and metabolism would include things like calcium and vitamin D and phosphorus, which we've already touched base on a couple of those. Also calcitonin, parathyroid hormone or the PTH, growth hormone, glucocorticoids, estrogen and androgens, um, thyroxin and insulin, all of these things are um, important for bone growth and metabolism. So as a person ages, we do have some musculoskeletal changes that do occur. In infancy to childhood, our bones continue to grow. Um, so that's an important part for us to have a good foundation and good structure of our um, adult bone maturity. In puberty, our bones reach maturity and maximum growth. And then from puberty to age 35, the bones go through a continuous process of formation, reabsorption, and destruction. And then the aged, our bone reabsorption increases, which decreases the overall bone mass. So our elderly are going to be prone to more problems such as balance, gait, and sensory issues. In your chapter 49 of Iggy, there's a great um, table on page 1007 that talks about the changes of the musculoskeletal system of the elderly. Then, then also gives you a lot of great nursing interventions that can help um, prevent problems with the aged. Much of this slide is a review for you. The musculoskeletal system assessment. We're gonna do a general inspection of the patient as they walk, looking at their posture and their gait. We're also gonna look at the structure of the um, overall musculoskeletal system, looking for any deformities. So we want to make sure that bones are nice and straight, no, no curvature in them, no um, abnormal shapes, and also looking at a skin assessment because we do know that we can have breaks in bones that do not penetrate the skin, but yet we can have problems with um, bony prominence and um, other things that can occur. So we want to do a good skin assessment on our patient. And then if we have patients that have some type of therapy that's related to the musculoskeletal system, looking at the skin assessment is also very important. Also, we're going to look at the mobility and the function assessment. So that, that is more like, um, can they perform their activities of daily living? Do they use any assistive devices? Um, do they know how to use the assistive devices, such as when they are climbing stairs? Um, are they going up with the good and down with the bad? Um, are they at the correct height uh, for the patient? And are they even using the, the equipment properly? And then the last thing on our slide is um, talking about a goniometer. And that's just a tool that provides the exact measurement um, of flexion extension or the range of motion of a joint. 
And typically we as nurses don't do that, but you may see some physical therapists um, utilize that um, in on like an ortho neuro unit when you have a patient that has um, had um, injuries and or maybe total knee um, checking the flexion of the knee. And this musculoskeletal assessment just shows us how our joints should move properly, such as our arms. We have extension and flexion of the elbow and then also of the wrist area. We have abduction and adduction. So if you lift your arm up away from your body, that would be abduction. If you pull it back to the body and have it straight on your thigh, that would be adduction. Um, knowing what pronation and supination are, and you can do that of um, not only when we move our patients, but in the position that you put the hand, you would have a pronation with the palm down and a supination with the palm up. Also looking at the um, extension and uh, inversion and inversion of our toes, um, looking at the movement or the rotation of our neck and um, the overall circumference of our shoulders and then um, just elevation and depression such as our, our um, shoulder shrug. So those are just some typical musculoskeletal system assessment, um, joint assessing how they're moving, um, that you would do that. So a physical assessment continued on our musculoskeletal system. We are looking at specific assessment findings such as pain. You all know how to um, assess for pain, making sure you get the rating from a zero to 10 scale, describing the pain, um, describing the onset of pain, the frequency and duration of pain. Crepitus would be if we feel like a popping or a cracking in the joint itself as it's moving or as we're palpating it. Effusion would be fluid accumulation and that we might see especially on the joint like the knee joint itself if it becomes um, injured. Sometimes we have fluid accumulation that will occur on that joint and it becomes difficult for the patient to bend the joint um, or sometimes you even see the visible swelling of that joint. Other thing we're going to do is a neurovascular assessment. Um, I know that you're going to see the five P's. Um, now they have the six P's and depending on what reference you look at they might change just slightly um, but your slide talks about um, pain um, where, where is the pain? You know, describe it. The pulse, do we have a good pulse? And we need to compare that from one joint or one extremity to the other. Um, pallor, what is the color of our extremity? We want to make sure that it is nice and pink or a tan color. We don't want it to be white, pasty, or pale. Um, paresthesia, can our patient feel if we touch the bottom of the, the extremity? Um, and also paralysis, can they even move that? Another thing that they look at is possibly pressure and then also looking at the temperature, feeling of the temperature from one extremity to the other. So always want to begin with the injured side, um, addressing the um, assessment findings of that. Palpate the pulses below the level of injury. Remember, if we cannot palpate the pulse, um, we'll want to use a Doppler. If it is difficult to find the pulse, we want to make sure that we make an X wherever we're finding the pulse so the next person coming behind us can also feel the pulse in that same position. Um, what is the strength of the pulse? Is it weak? Is it thready? Or is it nice and bounding? Checking the sensation and movement of that joint, checking the color again. Um, checking the temperature, you know, is it hot? which might mean that there is some fluid buildup there or infection, or is it cold, meaning that they don't have good circulation there. And then we've already talked about the pain a little bit. Um, the one thing about hip pain that I just wanna to mention to you, um, that hip pain can also radiate to the groin area or in the knee area. So if we have a patient that has had a fall and they start complaining of pain in the groin or radiating down the leg, that can be a sign of hip pain. Um, whether it happens to be um, from a bone itself or whether it's from a nerve injury, 
So if we have nerve injury, you know that um, it's gonna feel more like a shooting pain itself, not just an aching radiating pain. So a muscular skeletal assessment, we would actually note the size and shape and tone of the um, muscle itself. We're gonna check the strength and we're gonna compare that from um, one extremity to the other. We're gonna look at the symmetry and make sure that the um, bone is symmetrical and that um, it is not um, deformed in any way um, and that the patient also has good rotation of the, the joint itself. And then our last thing is our psychosocial assessment. Um, does this affect the patient's activities of daily living? Have they had a prolonged absence from employment? Um, are they disabled temporarily or is this something that has caused a permanent or may cause a permanent disability on our patient? The other thing we wanna find out is this pain new, a new onset of pain or is it a chronic pain that has been happening? Are there any changes there? And we have to remember that when we have patients that have uh, musculoskeletal problems that affect um, our overall health, it can affect our anxiety and our depression also. Um, not being able to do the things we want to or used to be able to do can cause a problem, uh, can cause a big problem with body image. So if we have a severe deformity or maybe we have a, an amputation, whether it is elective or um, emergent or from a traumatic injury, it still can affect our overall body image does our patient have good support system that's gonna help them um, through this time? And also, what are their coping mechanisms? How are they able to deal with the situation at hand? Your baseline assessment is important, but after your first assessment, then you always have to think about your focus assessment and identify um, the issues that may have changed from your baseline. Always checking to see if you can find a pulse. If you cannot find that pulse, you need to get a Doppler and Doppel the pulse so you can hear that. Always mark that spot with an X so that the next person will know where to find that or if it's a, a weak pulse, also do that. But again, if you cannot feel a pulse and you do not get the pulse with the Doppler, it is an absolute mandatory thing. You need to let the physician know about that. Um, other focus assessments that become very important, not only with the musculoskeletal, but the circulation, we wanna know, um, are we having any issues with our cardiac um, system, our respiratory system, integumentary system, and then bowel and bladder. All of these systems can be affected from a musculoskeletal injury. Um, and again, if you think about um, the decreased mobility, um, we can have problems with deep vein thrombosis, which affects our circulation. We can have problems with um, decreased respiratory status. If um, we have uh, a pneumonia that might be setting in because we're not as active as we were. So make sure you listen to the lung sounds well and also encourage the patients to use their incidence barometer. Looking at the integumentary, whether or not there's an injury there or whether it's just from um, being bedridden and not moving around. Bowel and bladder also remember that if we are not moving well that um, we can have some urinary retention that can occur. We also have um, peristalsis of our intestines that will decrease. So we have problems with constipation and urinary retention. Case study question, a 54 year old man presents to the emergency department with a deformed right ankle. He states that he was jogging close to the edge of the hillside and that he tripped and fell down the hill. There are no openings in the skin a pulse cannot be obtained by touch to the right foot, which is, which is pale and cool to palpation. The patient rates his pain as an, eight, as an eight out of a zero to 10 scale. What is a priority nursing action at this time? Again, priority and it's a nursing action. A, administer pain medications. B, prepare reduction. C, obtain a doppel of the right foot pulse. Or D, notify the physician of the lack of pulse in the right foot. So in identifying this question, the correct answer would be C. Um, before we would want to ever call the doctor that there was no pulse in the foot, we would want to doppel it, um, and then we could notify the doctor um, 
if we couldn't detect one or if we still could. We want to know um, that that is number one thing that we need to do. Um, after that, the next thing would be administering pain med. Actually, it is very important that we have um, our patient with pain that's under control, but if we don't have good circulation to that injury, um, the pain doesn't really, um, is not a priority. Some, some diagnostic labs that we um, need to take a look at. Your book in Iggy on page 1012 has a great chart there that talks about each individual test, um, the normal ranges, and then significance of some of the abnormals. I'm gonna just highlight a few on this um, slide. Serum calcium normal levels zero, or excuse me, nine to 10.5. When we see hypocalcemia, this just indicates that we have bone fractures that are in the healing stage. Um, serum phosphorus levels, 3 to 4.5. Hyperphosphatemia is bone fractures that are in the healing stage. So you have a hypocalcemia and a hyperphosphatemia. Um, alkaline phosphatate ranges 30 to 120, and that is elevated with many bone disorders. The serum muscle enzyme, or the CKMM, um, in males, it's going to be at 55 to 170. In females, it's going to be 30 to 135. And elevations are present with muscle trauma. The lactic dehydrogenase, or LDH, levels 100 to 190. Elevations of this are going to be with skeletal muscle necrosis. So the tissues actually um, are dying because there's not enough um, tissue perfusion to that specific muscle. The AST and AL, AD, ALD, sorry, will all both be le elevated. Um, so the AST is going to be 0 to 35 normal. With elevations, you're going to see the skeletal muscle trauma. And with the LD, ALD, um, 3 to 8.2, we're going to see elevations with um, muscle trauma or muscle damage, I should say. A few diagnostics or imagings that you may see on patients that have musculoskeletal trauma. Um, the standard x-ray is going to just give you a good picture of um, the bone itself and if there is a break or a um, crack in the bone. A myelogram or myelography is where they actually inject dye into the subarachnoid space um, of the spine via, the spi via a spinal uh, puncture and this will actually show muscle problems itself. The CT or a CAT scan is a test of choice for injuries or pathology that involve bone only. But if we have something that is gonna involve the soft tissue, the MRI is gonna be the most appropriate diagnostic for our joints, our soft tissues, and any bony tumors that might be present. And the um, arthrogram is an x-ray study of the joint after dye has been injected. And so that's gonna just enhance the visualization and allow um, the provider to be able to see um, a better um, picture of what that injury might be. A few more specifics. The bone biopsy is going to um, be used to confirm the presence of infection or a neoplasm. We wanna make sure after a bone biopsy, one of our nursing actions is to watch for bleeding um, and also watch for infection so you know what the signs and symptoms are of those two are. The muscle biopsy we're gonna to use to diagnose either um, an inflamed or a muscle that's atrophied or um, smaller in size than it should be. The electromyography is used to um, evaluate the muscle weakness. Um, there is a risk to this particular test with our patients. They can have a headache, which will normally resolve in one to two days, but we need to encourage fluid and rest on these particular patients. And then our last one on the slide is an arthroscopy. This is a diagnostic procedure that uses the um, fiber optic tube or the scope that's inserted directly into the joint for visualization, not only of the um, ligaments, but of the menisci and the articulate surfaces of the joint. Um, needing consent for any of these procedures that um, are invasive and also any of them that are in, that dye might be included with them. Um, and then also I want you to remember with any of the patients that we do have to use 
um, dye on, we need to make sure that we know what their allergies are and that they're not allergic to any um, shellfish. The other thing with an arthroscopy is post-op compression and also observe for any kind of drainage. So we want to look for, um, you know, making sure we have a good circulation to that um, foot and then or that extremity and then also make sure that we watch for unusually a large amount of drainage or drainage that becomes infectious. So here's a good diagram of some common types of fractures. Um, we have a closed fracture or one that is non-displaced. There is no break through the skin and you can see that the bone is still in pretty good straight alignment. There just happens to be a, um, a fracture in the bone itself. The opened or compound fracture is a bone fracture that extends through the skin. So actually the bone has been broken in two pieces and we have a piece that now is puncturing through the outside of the skin. Um, high risk for infection on these particular patients. Um, a comminuted or fragmented fracture are where we have bones that are splintered into little tiny fragments um, of numerous amounts depending on what um, the injury is from. A displaced fracture or a complete fracture is where there's a break across the entire cross section of the bone. So um, the bone's not um, in proper alignment. However, there's not um, a puncture in the skin at all. Oblique, there's a diagonal break in this particular um, type of fracture. An impacted or depressed fracture, that just means that we have a um, bone that's been driven into another section of the bone, so the bone becomes shortened. And I did skip a spiral fracture, and this is from a twisted break. This mainly um, can occur when um, you know, you're doing an activity that requires you to move in um, different um, directions, such as a gymnast, and or this can be seen um, with um, possibly child abuse where um, somebody will grab a hold of the child's arm or leg and the child tries to get away and, um, and or the, the, the uh, um, abuser twists that extremity. And then a green stick is an incomplete fracture. So there actually is a break in the, in the cross section um, of the bone. However, it does not go through the entire cross section, just partial. So these are common types of fractures. Okay, so let's put on our thinking cap. The nurse is taking a patient for testing to determine the extent of injury sustained to the patient's knee when a fall occurred at work. The nurse explains that which diagnostic test best demonstrates musculoskeletal and soft tissue damage. A, standard x-rays. B, elect electromyography or EMG. C, um, a computed tomography or a CT. Or D, a magnetic resonance Im imaging or an MRI. Again, as talked in just a few slides ago, the MRI is most useful in determining the amount of soft tissue damage that has occurred with a fracture. Standard x-rays and CTs mainly tell us about the break itself, and then looking at the EMGs, that tells us with muscle problems. So being able to tell about the musculoskeletal and the soft tissue, answer D is our correct answer. With an arthroscopy, this is just a, a picture of what, what, what one might look like. Um, I just wanted to discuss a little bit about the nursing care. Again, we need to have a pre-op um, informed consent and then do all the other regular pre-op things that we would do for any other um, procedure such as education um, and doing a good assessment and making sure our patient is clean and, and taking certain personal belongings um, away from them. So that would be, you know, a pre-op. A post-op is the main thing that I want you to focus on right now, and that would be doing a good um, assessment. So again, this would be considered a focused assessment. We will do many focused assessments on a patient that has an injury to a musculoskeletal um, system. So think about your six Ps we talked about um, and know what those are. We will give mild analgesics or opioid analgesics depending on what is ordered and the severity of the injury. We can do ice for 24 hours, so we want to uh, put some ice on that 
injured area, we can elevate um, for the first 12 to 24 hours um, typically, and if we need to elevate beyond that, we can. We're gonna observe for swelling, increased pain, thrombophlebitis, and infection, so you're looking for any complications there. And don't forget, we need to educate our patients on um, activity um, and then just how to care for that injury itself. Musculoskeletal trauma can include multiple fractures, crush injuries, and traumatic amputations. And then we'll talk about some complications that go along with that also. When we have multiple fractures or our patients have multiple fractures, it puts them at even higher risk for complications. Um, again, you know, it doesn't matter if it's one arm fracture and one leg fracture, we still have two fractures, which means multiple fractures, or maybe we have an arm fracture, two leg fractures, rib fractures, um, equal multiple fractures, and of course that's a very bad day. What we also have to think about there in that situation is we have rib fractures and now we can have complications to our lungs itself and maybe having pneumothorax. So there's a lot of different things that can affect um, the overall body um, when we have multiple fractures. Complications of fractures can include acute compartment syndrome, crush syndrome, hemorrhage or hypovolemic shock, fat embolism, venous thrombosis, infection, and then there are some chronic complications that are listed in your book also, ischemic, ne ischemic necrosis, delayed union, and complex regional pain syndrome. So your book does a good job of talking about some of these, and we will discuss um, them more in, not all of them, but some of them more in depth. And crush injuries are prolonged continuous pressure on large muscles, which result in muscle disintegration. Also, crush injuries can lead to compartment syndrome, and we'll talk a little bit more about compartment syndrome. What I want you to remember is crush injuries don't have to be involved in just a motor vehicle accident. It could be anything that causes prolonged pressure to that um, joint, to that um, appendage of the body. Um, and then I have, um, Beyond the basics, crush injuries and compartment syndrome, at the bottom here, there's an article that you might be able to find if you want to read a little bit more information on that. You'll find some good stuff there. Complications of crush injuries include rhabdomyolysis, which is actually the release of the myoglobin from the muscle, which places the patient at high risk for developing um, rhabdomyolysis, um, and then also can affect the kid kidneys itself and cause acute kidney injury. So this does require immediate intervention. Hyperkalemia, so our patients with high levels of potassium that have been released are at high risk for um, cardiac dysrhythmias. You know the bone is high va highly vasculature, so our patients are at um, high risk for excessive blood loss, and so hypovolemia and hypovolemic shock can occur. And then peripheral nerve injury, um, we just need to remember that um, with any kind of musculoskeletal trauma that we can have peripheral nerve injury and that we have to assess our patients well. Um, remember, spinal nerve injury is not likely with lower extremity injuries. Um, it's mainly present if we see um, problems with the back or the spine or neck itself. So this question should be fairly easy, but put on your thinking cap. The nurse is taking care, um, or the nurse knows that the patient with crush injuries to the lower extremity is high risk for what complications? A, bradycardia, B, hypotension, C, acute kidney injury, or D, spinal nerve injury? So our correct answer here is C. Remember that we just talked about rhabdomyolysis with crush injuries and it can cause acute kidney injury. We would not see a bradycardia um, because if we have a high uh, blood loss do, that does occur, we would end up seeing tachycardia. Hypotension would not be present unless we do have the um, loss of blood, excessive loss of blood. And then spinal nerve injury, remember we talked about on the previous slide, that that <coughs> typically does not occur with lower extremity injuries. So we will talk a little bit more about some of these complications um, on the next few slides and some of the rationale that helps explain everything. Traumatic amputations, unlike amputations that are elective from things like diabetes and poor circulation, traumatic amputations would occur from um, a motor vehicle crash, industrial equipment, 
and your book talks about upper extremities are typically um, that is the number one cause of upper extremity traumatic amputations can be from war war related injuries um, and so forth so a lot of different um, things can cause the traumatic amputations um, when looking at um, the management of that, of course, 911, and we also always have to be aware of our ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation first. Applying direct pressure with um, sterile, of course, is best, but clean um, towels or, or rags or something that would um, stop the bleeding, um, elevate the extremity above the heart, um, and then the one thing that we need to know is severe, um, well, what do we do with a severed limb? Um, we would wrap it, bag it, submerge it in ice water, and then send it with the client. So we wanna make sure that the, the extremity is protected first. So that's why we wrap and bag it, and then we put it in the ice water to help preserve that, hoping that maybe we can um, have that reattached onto our patients. Um, your book has um, traumatic amputations that are listed on 1050 and 1051 in Iggy. Um, just talks a little bit more about that. And it also has some complications that are associated with that. Again, um, it can be hemorrhage um, leading to hypovolemic shock, infection, phantom limb pain, which I'm gonna let you read just a little bit about that, um, where the patient feels like that there is pain and um, they have sensation of a limb that is not there anymore. Neuroma and then also flexion contractures. So those are gonna be things that um, are some of the complications associated with these. What makes a traumatic amputation different from a scheduled or an elective amputation? We really need to think about the ex um, extensive tissue damage that occurs with the traumatic amputation. Um, so it is much more difficult in healing, uh, much more um, trauma to that tissue itself, and also the blood loss. We have a higher risk for hemorrhage and also hypovolemic shock. Um, so those are some things that would be um, really important for us to watch for with our shock. Um, the other thing is emergent and uncontrolled situation. You know, what is happening and why did it, why did that occur? Um, and so not only the, the uh, problem with the amputation, traumatic amputation itself, but what is the overall safety of the scene? Um, we need to think about that. We have to also think about s to attempt to save the life, not only salvage the limb, but um, because of all these complications, our patient is gonna be at much higher risk um, for um, loss of life. And then they are at much higher risk for infection because of how the um, injury occurred. So we're gonna move on just a little bit to therapeutic and immobilization devices, casts, splints, traction, external fixators, internal fixators. Um, those are some of the, the ways that they um, will help immobilize an injury um, of the extremity. Your book has some good information on that. Um, typically now we see casts that are in synth that are synthetic casts um, and so they dry very quickly. You don't have to worry about that drying time, but when you're helping put on a cast, it's going to be really important that um, you know you know proper cast care as far as um, how to take care of the cast. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. Splints, you want to make sure that splints aren't too tight. Um, and that you're checking the skin underneath the splints. Um, the traction, the, your book um, does have some good pictures in it. Um, you know, what we would call a Bucks traction is more like an external traction that you put the boot on, similar to what you've seen in our skills lab. Um, this just allows for realignment of the um, joint itself, but sometimes we have to have um, external fixators that are made of metal that actually have pins that go through the tissue and the bone itself to be able to stabilize that. A lot of times that will occur if we have open wounds to the, the extremity itself. 
and then internal fixators would be um, if we actually made an incision on the skin and then went in and fixed the bone internally, whether it would be with a prosthetic device, such as some of the things you see in your book, or whether it is just with pins and metal and screws, um, and then they will end up having to remove those. But we again, we can have a closed reduction and an open reduction, just depending on the type of injury. Closed reduction would be that um, we don't make any incision and they manually reset the extremity with uh, force, whether it's with um, manual force or whether it's with pulling of, um, utilizing of weights and then open reduction, like I said, that's gonna be where you actually make an incision. Um, so your patients are gonna be at high risk there for um, infection, so we wanna watch for that. Nursing actions that are associated with these immobilization devices. Again, we can't mention this enough, neurovascular checks um, hourly for the first 24 hours because of the swelling. Our patients are at high risk for having problems with um, compromised um, nerve and also vessel damage. Pain management is going to be really important and, um, you know, we're not going to talk a lot about specific pain management. Um, we're going to see a shift probably from some of the opioid pain management that has been going on um, for when you send a patient home. However, um, pain management may need morphine um, or some um, type of opioid to help with that. Sometimes they give muscle relaxers also to help um, relax those muscles so that they're not spasming. Um, and then sometimes we just need some ibuprofen or something like that that will help with the inflammation. Cast care is also important. Um, when we do um, help put a cast on or if a cast needs drying time, we need to make sure we're handling the cast with our palms, not our fingertips, because we don't want our fingertips to cause indentions on the cast, which would then cause pressure indentions on the skin inside the cast. So we have to be um, aware of that. Also, we want to avoid setting casts on hard surfaces or sharp edges. So you want to make sure that you are propping the casts up on soft pillows, elevating the um, extremity above the heart for 24 to 48 hours post injury, um, making sure that the cast is not too tight. The rule is you should be able to get one finger in between the skin and the cast itself. Um, and we never want to put any type of devices inside the cast itself. So we don't want to cause any damage to the skin. Um, we do want to document drainage if we see any drainage on the um, cast. And um, your book talks about um, whether or not to um, like take a marker and circle around the amount of drainage. They say it's not really a reliable indicator and it may make the patient anxious. However, um, I feel like that um, that's one of the only ways that you can gauge that well is if you mark the drainage and then watch for that drainage to seep beyond that marking. But remember, sometimes you may have more drainage underneath. So anytime there's new drainage, fresh drainage, um, and it's more than just a, a little, um, you know, dime size, quarter size, whatever, you want to make sure that you're checking the cast itself and the um, the firmness of the cast because if the cast starts getting soft that means that there is a lot of drainage underneath the tissue and then we also need to educate our patients on cast care and all the things we just talked about it is good for them to be able to wiggle their fingers and that will help with the movement of the fingers and help with swelling of that um, so uh, make sure education is important. And again, with um, a, just a reminder on your neurovascular checks, remember the six P's that we talked about earlier in this presentation. So tighten up your thinking cap. Here we go. A middle-aged patient has a tight cast on the left lower leg. Which assessment finding would prompt the nurse to assess further for compartment syndrome? A, diminished pulses. B, discoloration of some of the toes. C, tingling sensation of the upper leg, 
or D, pain more intense than expected based on initial injury? So looking at all these answers, you would probably say they're all correct. How am I gonna choose which one? I want you to remember that um, diminished pulses, uh, cyanosis, and a tingling sensation means nerve um, involvement. All of those are late signs. They are important, but the thing that you need to be watching for is if your patient complains, complains of pain, it's more intense than what your baseline has been, and or you're giving pain medication and it's not being relieved, that's gonna be your number one sign. So D is our correct answer here. Um, and I also have, I know that the, the source listed below, um, if you can still find it, um, it's from 2014, but there is um, a article that talks about late signs of compartment syndrome and a website that you can maybe go to to read a little bit more about that. So case study question, an ankle x-ray confirms that a patient has an ankle fracture. A fiberglass class cast is applied to immobilize the ankle and allow for healing. Which are priority interventions after the cast is applied? Select all that apply. Monitor for signs of infection. Assess peripheral capillary refill. Ask the patient about frequency of bowel movements. Keep the cast uncovered for air drying over several hours and insert a finger between the skin and cast to be sure that the cast is not too tight. The correct answers are A, B, and E. So the word here is priority interventions. Um, we know that A is always important, looking for signs of infection. B is always important, assessing our six Ps. We wanna make sure we have good capillary refill and also no nerve involvement. And then E, we want to make sure that the cast is not too tight because if it does get too tight, that can cause um, increased swelling and also can cause nerve damage and tissue damage. Um, I know looking at C, you're probably wondering why aren't we asking about frequent bowel movements? Well, this patient just had the cast put on and so they haven't been on pain medicine long enough and they haven't been immobilized um, so the patient we don't really have to worry about their bowel movements at this point so that's why it's not a priority and then looking at D um, we don't necessarily need to keep the cast covered we want to um, make sure that um, we have um, a synthetic cast which will dry and I told you really quickly within 10 to 15 minutes so we can actually use that cast within 30 minutes after application. So the drying time isn't needed, so we don't necessarily need to make sure that we have the cast uncovered. Now, if this was a plaster cast, that would be a different story. So again, our correct answers are A, B, and E. The patient's ankles heals and his cast is removed. What education will the nurse include when teaching the patient to care for his ankle after the cast is removed. A, scrub your lower leg and ankle to remove the dead scaly skin. B, wear the support stocking to prevent lower extremity swelling. C, keep your ankle in a low position to facilitate perfusion um, to the healed bone. Or D, exercise vigorously at least three times a day as directed by the physical therapist. The correct answer here is B, wear a support stocking to prevent lower extremity swelling. So that would be like putting on a TED hose that's going to help with the return circulation. Um, we still can't have some swelling afterwards. So number one, we never would want to scrub the skin because that can cause, um, you know, skin damage. So we have to gently cleanse the skin, not necessarily scrubbing it. And we also want to remove that by soaking um, and then putting some lotion on it. Um, uh, we may have to elevate the leg still at times, so um, keeping the ankle in a low position to per facilitate perfusion doesn't even make any sense here. And then our last one, we would not want to do vigorous exercise. Exercise should be done slowly, so it's going to be um, a progressive type of thing for that particular patient. 
So let's go back to traction just a little bit because traction is the other way that we will Im immobilize a fractured um, extremity. And so with traction, that is the exertion of pulling force utilized to align and immobilize bone fragments. So again, the purpose of this to is to align the bones of the fracture, also help reduce muscle spasms, and then it also will help relieve pain. So when you are taking care of a patient that is in traction, if all of a sudden their pain goes up, one of the things you want to do is check the traction and make sure everything is good with the traction. Um, the types we've already talked about are skin traction, Bucks and Russell traction, and then skeletal traction. And your book on page 1041 and 1042 just has a, a picture of both of those for you to view. So when we have a patient that is in traction, we have to also assess the traction itself along with our extremity, but the weight should be hanging freely. We wanna make sure that they are not um, resting on the bed or resting on the floor. The rope should be tight. Um, we don't want any slack in the rope, so make sure that the ropes are nice and straight and tight. A trapeze bar is the bar that goes above and over the head of the bed. This helps the patient move around, and so it's very important to make sure that we have a trapeze bar so that our patient can lift their um, bottom up off the bed, um, change their positions just a little bit, and this will help with uh, preventing uh, pressure injuries. We need to make sure that we are checking pressure points, not only on their backside, but on um, you know the bottoms of the heels and, and on other areas that are resting on the bed. And then if they are in skeletal traction, we wanna check the pin sites. We wanna look for unusual um, drainage. Um, there may be a little bit of serosanguinous uh, sanguinous drainage at first, but then that should, um, that should diminish. Um, and also we should never have drainage that is cloudy or has a foul appearance. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're assessing the pin sites and the drainage for that also. A few complications associated with the traction, a couple we've already talked about. Um, skin breakdown just from the pressure of the patient being in bed. Infection because of the open, um, open skin or where the pin sites are. Our patient can actually have problems with orthostatic hypotension, so we need to be really careful with that and monitor blood pressures. And then lastly, what they call boredom or cabin fever, which because they're tied to the bed and they can't get up and out of the bed, um, can lead to depression. So we need to be um, attuned to assessing our psychosocial needs of our patients. And here's a great example of an external fixator. This um, leg was severely damaged, as you can see, but this um, not only has severe skin damage, but um, obviously bone damage. We have a fracture immobilization now that is utilizing these percutaneous pins and wires that are attached to this rigid external frame or known as the external fixator. Nursing care, again, um, elevating that extremity, putting it up on pillows, making sure we are monitoring our neurovascular status, our skin integrity, um, probably having to do wound care on this patient. Also performing skin care every, or pin care, not, not skin care, pin care every eight to 12 hours and assessing for those things we talked about on the slide prior. Make sure that you are also um, being aware that this patient is at high risk for pneumonia. Um, so we want to encourage the patient to turn, cough, and deep breathe, use of incentive spirometer, um, always have VTE protocol in place, and then observe for other complications. So um, our patient is gonna be in bed for quite a bit and so think about the complication of um, constipation and issues with our bowels. So we wanna make sure that we are addressing our bowels um, daily with our patients. So musculoskeletal trauma complications as a whole, we've mentioned several of these already. Hypovolemic shock, fat embolism, acute compartment syndrome, avascular necrosis, and rhabdomyolysis. So um, make sure you know what each one of these are, and we're going to discuss them briefly over the next few slides. Hypovolemic shock is excessive fluid loss from 
uh, blood secondary to trauma. We want to monitor our ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation, making sure we administer high flow oxygen if it's not contraindicated, such as with a patient who has COPD. We need to prepare to intubate um, to make sure that we do uh, maintain that airway. Um, insert and maintain IV access, administering IV fluids and IV medications as needed. And then if our patient is hypotensive and the blood pressure drops, we want to make sure that we lie our patient flat um, with the legs elevated. So the head is lower than the heart and um, lower than the extremities. The other thing is always making sure we have um, resuscitative equipment available um, in case we um, are needing it. And then we would consider, um, of course, giving blood products along with the, the IV access that we talked about. Fat embolism or fat embolism syndrome, FES, is a serious circulatory condition characterized by the blocking of the artery from an embolus of fat that enters the circulatory system. This is a complication of long bone fractures or um, total joint replacements, um, and it can occur 12 to 48 hours after the injury or the surgery. Early signs and symptoms would include dyspnea, tachypnea, hypoxemia and respiratory distress, along with headache and level of consciousness changes, tachycardia and chest pain. Our late signs and symptoms would be petechiae on the neck, chest, upper arms and abdomen. And your book on page 1034 has a really good chart that talks about um, the pulmonary emboli um, or the fat emboli that can occur. Um, lab findings that might be um, abnormal would be a low PaO2, usually below 60, an increased erythrocyte sedimentation rate, a decreased serum calcium level, decreased red blood cell and platelet count, and also increased serum level um, of lipids. So those would be some of the things that we might see. Um, and then you're, they're going to be doing um, chest x-rays, chest CTs, and then MRI is truly what's going to tell us the difference between um, if it is um, just patchy opacities or if it is a true pul uh, pulmonary or fat embolism. I know your homework talked about the treatment of the, pa of the um, fat embolism, and we're going to talk about that um, a little bit on our next page also. So our rapid nursing action um, need to be prevention. First off, immobilization of our fractures with minimal ma manipulation is going to be how we would prevent a fat embolism. We want to identify early signs and symptoms and report them so that we can start our treatment quickly. We want to maintain bed rest, which will help prevent the movement of that um, emboli throughout the system. We want to apply oxygen and also provide respiratory support as needed. May need to do um, ventilatory support. Medication-wise, we would administer corticosteroids for the inflammation, vasopressors to help with our blood pressure um, and getting our pressure back up, fluid replacement, pain medications as needed, um, and then also anti-anxiety medication because patients have that sense of um, doom and get very anxious with this. Um, and so these are some of the ways that we would rapidly treat fat embolism. Acute compartment syndrome is another one of our complications. It is excessive swelling that occurs in the compartment of the muscle tissue, nerves, and blood vessels, which can block the blood flow to the injured area. Really good picture here. You can see that um, our extremity is uh, the change of color that has happened here, um, a lot of edema, and then they did have to go ahead and do the fasciotomy, which is the treatment of choice here. So our signs and symptoms would be a decreased sensation of the extremity, numbness and tingling, paleness of the skin, increased pain that is not relieved with the pain medications um, that we discussed earlier, or it is just more intense and it's just not going away. Um, and then we can't have intense pain when um, the extremity is passively moved. 
and also weakness. And again, the treatment for this is going to be surgical incision through the muscle tissue um, and to release the pressure through the fascia, which is called a fasciotomy. We would need to be doing um, daily wound care, maybe more than one time of day, um, packing that wound, keeping the wound moist, um, preventing infection and watching for signs of infection. You have um, some explanation at the bottom of this slide that just talks about the compartment syndrome in depth from the beginning to end. And so that kind of will help you understand what is going on there also. So the rapid action for our acute compartment syndrome include assessing the neurovascular status. We wanna make sure that we're assessing our six Ps, that we pick up on problems early and we report them to the physician. We want to educate the patient on what to report. So pain that is not relieved or pain that is worsening or when they have numbness or tingling or color changes of the extremities, we want them to report those to us so that we can pick up on them quickly. Um, again, report changes in the condition to the healthcare, healthcare provider. We want to loosen any constrictive clothing. Um, may need to assist with cast cutting procedure if this extremity is in a cast. And then again, we talked about wound care, post fasciotomy, which is really important. We're gonna utilize sterile packing, um, sometimes may use negative pressure wound therapy or like a wound vac. And um, eventually skin grafts may be needed to allow these wounds to heal completely. A vascular necrosis is a, another complication of our um, musculoskeletal trauma injuries. So this is a result from circulatory compromise that occurs after the fracture. The blood flow is disrupted to the site, resulting in ischemia, which leads to tissue and bone necrosis or tissue death and bone death. Common, um, this is common with fractures of displaced bones and also with um, bones such as surgical repair uh, fractures. Um, clients will need to receive uh, long-term corticosteroid therapy to help with this. And many times the treatment will include bone grafts and also maybe even needing prosthetic replacements. We want to talk a little bit about rhabdomyolysis being um, the other complication that I mentioned early. It is an acute muscle breakdown caused by crush injuries. The circulation of byproducts of skeletal muscle destruction, which accumulates in the renal tubules, will lead to acute renal failure, which again is life-threatening because of hyperkalemia and can cause um, dysrhythmias of the heart and also metabolic acidosis. Also, this can lead to internal organ injury and death. So, rhabdomyolysis is definitely something that is severe and very um, life-threatening for our patients. It is noted by profound muscle weakness that is caused that causes ineffective respiratory effort leading to respiratory failure. So this is one of our multi-system complications that um, we just need to be aware of with our patients that have musculoskeletal injuries. It can be caused from other things such as toxic effects of drugs, um, extreme of exertion, heat stroke, sepsis shock, uh, electric shock, um, hyponatremia, and lipid lowering agents. But um, we're today just really mentioning it because it's association with our musculoskeletal injuries. And continuing on with rhabdomyolysis, the history, um, when we look at lab work, we're gonna see elevated creatinine kinase five times the upper normal limit, so extremely high. Remember the treatment um, goal is to preserve our kidney function. So we're gonna do things like um, IV normal saline and be really aggressive with the infusion of IV fluids. Um, I think one of the articles that I read discussed about one and a half liters per hour. So it's really re aggressive IV fluid three IV fluid replacement. Um, also IV bicarbonate um, containing fluids to enhance urinary secretions of the myoglobin itself. Um, may use diuretics to help get rid of extra excess fluids. Um, hemodialysis may be needed to help preserve the kidney function. 
And then if it is due to the compartment syndrome, uh, fasciotomy will help with that. We want to monitor our patients for hypocalcemia, um, hyperkalemia, and also, again, dysrhythmias from those electrolyte imbalances. And the signs and symptoms that we would see with rhabdomyolysis would be a urine that has changed color, becoming dark, reddish, tea-colored, so um, not our normal urine that is yellow, um, a decreased urine output, Patients will complain of weakness and fatigue and also have muscle aches. So they're just not gonna feel well and overall um, body aches. Nursing care for this is gonna be bed rest and we wanna prevent complications of immobility. So just watching for and preventing pressure injuries and also prevention of pneumonia with deep breathing and use of incentospirometer. So we've already mentioned a few of the medications um, that may be needed for musculoskeletal injuries as a whole. Analgesic being our um, acetaminophen and our ibuprofen, our muscle relaxers to help um, prevent muscle spasms. Um, I don't have um, opioids listed on here, but probably list those with our analgesics um, as needed. Stool softeners will be really important for patients that are um, bedridden um, or will have decreased mobility after um, an injury occurs. And then also sometimes they will put them on prophylactic antibiotics, if not antibiotics, um, just because of signs of infection. So um, those are some of the medications that will be specific to musculoskeletal injuries. Another case study question, to control the patient's pain, which prescription would the nurse anticipate being written by the provider? A, morphine, one to two milligrams IV. B, mepridine uh, or meperidine, 50 milligrams IM. C, acetaminophen, 650 milligrams by mouth. And D, apply ice to the right ankle. So our correct answer here is A. We just wanna, um, make note that we typically wouldn't be giving anything IM, and so our meperidine or Demerol um, won't necessarily help our patient. We can also have problems with um, toxic effects on our older adults, and so that isn't used very often anymore. So morphine is gonna be our drug of choice. Acetaminophen typically won't help moderate to severe pain, so again, it's gonna depend on how far out this patient's pain is um, and also a good uh, pain assessment. And then we know that ice will help with swelling and pain, but it's not gonna necessarily relieve the patient's pain. So it's not gonna be our priority choice. So health and safety related education is important. What should we teach our clients before injury? Of course, it's always prevention, um, clear pathways, um, nothing on the, in the pathway for tripping, no throw rugs, good lighting, um, non-skid socks and shoes, um, and then use of assistive devices as needed. And then our patients that um, have occurred an injury, we need to make sure they learn about safety and infection control. So good hand washing, monitoring for signs of infection and reporting those, um, making sure that um, we keep our dressings clean and dry and intact. And then also, Remember mobility versus immobility. Our patients that are immobile um, are not gonna get well. Um, they're gonna have much more complications respiratory wise and GI. And then when we look at the patient using crutches, we wanna make sure that they're walking correctly with them, standing on the good leg as it is a crutch and then advance the bag, bad leg. And then when they go upstairs, we want them to go up with the good and down with the bad and then use of walker. Always remember they move the walker, the bad leg, the good leg, and that way we have um, support to help um, prevent any further weight bearing on that bad leg. So the walker, the bad leg, and the good leg. So we can't forget about self-concept issues. So here's a case study question. The patient tells the nurse that he was jogging to the train for a marathon um, which has been his lifelong goal. He asked, will I ever be able to run a marathon now? 
What is the correct nursing response? A, the doctor will be able to tell you that. B, of course, after this heals, you will be fine. C, it is unlikely that your ankle will regain the necessary strength. Or D, it sounds like you have concerns that you may not be able to achieve your goal. Again, our correct answer is D, acknowledging the patient's goal recognizes his feelings and allows him to continue to express his concerns. We don't want to defer. We don't want to tell the patient or minimize anything. We don't want to express doubt when we don't really know what's going to go on. So D is our correct answer. I just added this slide so that you can think about some cultural, legal, and ethical issues related to alteration in mobility. I think your book might have a, um, a um, box that discusses that. But if we think about um, potential issues, we live in a male dominant culture that um, is dependent on others and, and we are needing assistance from females for ADL. So that may be uh, an issue if we have a male patient um, not wanting help from a female nurse. Also injuries to minors, we think about needing consent for treatment um, and also injuries due to impaired driving. So all of these things can be related to our cultural, legal, or ethical issues. And then musculoskeletal trauma priority concepts, mobility, sensory perception, pain or comfort, perfusion, and infection. And then I would also add elimination due to the narcotic and pain management for our patients. And last but not least, don't forget to review the NCLEX RN test blueprint or the test plan because ultimately that's what we want to make sure that you are able to identify these disease processes and how to provide nursing care in a safe manner. Have a great day. I just want to remind you that we do have a quiz that is posted on D2L and it has a due date of Friday. So make sure you get that done. Make sure you take your time in doing this quiz because we want as many points as we can for our examination points.